When somebody says that meat is inflammatory, meat causes, makes your system acidic, meat causes cancer, meat causes diverticulitis, diabetes, fatty liver, any of those things, that is just as stupid as saying that drinking pure, clean water is bad for you or that drinking, that breathing pure, clean air is somehow bad for you. What would happen if the world went carnival? So within, within uh, just a few days, there would be a... You are about to watch the most comprehensive interview I have ever done on this channel. Dr. Ken Berry and I discuss the most controversial topics, including honey and raw milk, supplements, and the most carnival approved foods that you shouldn't be eating, as well as the definitive answer on coffee. Now, I'm sure that you would love to hear from Dr. Jordan Peterson, Dr. Paul Mason, and Dr. Paul Saladino. Wouldn't you just love to hear what he has to say? Well, the bigger the channel grows, the better the guests I can get for you. But 70% of my viewers have not subscribed. And if you're one of them, please click that subscribe button. All right, let's get straight into the interview and don't forget to hit that like button if you found value in this video. Dr. Ken Berry, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So many people have started a carnival diet and you know what? It's because of the very important work that you do. But I find that many people are confused about how to start carnival the right way, especially when it comes to weight loss. So I'd love to talk to you today about the 10 hacks for people to start carnival the right way, starting sure. off with hack number one. So hack number one is just to realize, I think it's a, a mindset change or a, a paradigm shift, is that meat is not inflammatory. Meat is not fattening. Meat does not cause type 2 diabetes. Meat does not cause cancer. It does not cause diverticulitis. It does not cause kidney stones. It does not cause impotence. It does not cause low testosterone. Like yeah, I could go on and on and on uh, dispelling all the myths that are out there. But if you come to a way of eating and you've got these built-in fears or apprehensions, like, oh, I don't know, I heard that meat you know, will, will cause your nose to fall off then you're, even though you're like, well, gosh, all these people are getting healthier. So I'm going to try this, but I'm afraid. So one of the main things I try to help men and women understand is that there's no credible research that in any way proves that meat does a single bad thing to your body or your physiology. And this includes people of all ages, including children. Uh, Nisha and I have two young children and the first bite of solid food they took was meat. And the vast majority of the foods that they still eat at nine months of age and three and a half years old is meat each and every day. And I don't do that because I don't love my children. I do that because I love my children very much. And I want them to have the best chance of developing into beautiful, intelligent human beings who are wind up being well-adjusted and, and very successful adults. That's my goal for them. And so by, by feeding them this ancestrally appropriate, low carbohydrate, nutrient dense, uninflammatory food, which is meat, I'm giving them the leg up, the best head start, the best chance at being successful both uh, within their health, both physical and mental, and in every other aspect of their future life. And can I just say that I met Beckett at KetoCon, so we were invited to, to Dr. Berry and Nisha's Airbnb. Beckett mm -hmm. is the most, I would say the most intelligent young man I have ever met full of color, full of personality, full of energy, and he eats all meat. So what Dr. Berry is saying is absolutely correct. His kids are like amazing. Dr. Berry, what is hack number two to start the carnival diet the right way? Hack number two is to realize that one of the powers of a carnivore diet is that it is an elimination diet. And so what you're doing is you're eliminating everything from your diet except for meat and eggs with the yolk for some people uh, if you decide to do beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And so you're going to be re removing hundreds of foods from your diet that, and that's going to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of chemicals. <clears throat> now these are naturally occurring chemicals and also man-made chemicals. And so when you, when you start a carnivore diet, you're going to be re removing virtually all of the glyphosate from your diet. Uh, many people think oats are very healthy. They eat them every day. They don't realize that one of the last stages before oats are harvested is they're desiccated by being drenched in glyphosate. 
and some of that glyphosate winds up in your bowl of, of oats. And so although many of the plants that, that animals eat are treated with glyphosate, especially in the ruminant animals, their magical four-chamber stomach is able to eliminate virtually all of that. And so when you eat the meat of that ruminant, you're, you're going to be getting a minuscule amount, if any, of glyphosate and all the other chemicals that pervade our modern society. Uh, and so by eliminating all these things, and then you're going to also be eliminating the phytates, the lectins, the oxalates, all the other phytochemicals that plants put in their in their flesh as a means of pesticide and, and to, to prevent insects from eating them. And also, I, I think that they're humicides as well. I think they don't want humans to eat them they, just as much as they don't want insects to eat them. And so many of these phytochemicals, these polyphenols, uh, people act like that they're a good thing that they're in plants and a good thing that you eat lots and lots of them and they talk about the hormetic stress that comes from eating these phytochemicals. Uh, I think we can just say, we, we, you know, you, if I came to Turkey right now, Rena, and slapped you in the face, that would be a stress. And, and I guess you could pretend that it was hormetic if you'd like to. But I think in the end, it's just a stress and I shouldn't have slapped you and you shouldn't have been slapped. And so that's one of the very powerful things about a carnivore diet is you removed all those stressor chemicals that you were exposing your body to each and every day. And for many people, that's the answer. And then hack number three of starting carnivore is that it's a very, very low carbohydrate diet. And so you're going to be eliminating virtually all of the carbohydrates from your diet on a carnivore diet. And this is going to do several things. First of all, it's going to prove to you that there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, an essential sugar. It's going to prove to you that you you won't die. Your your brain won't cease to function if you don't have daily sugars and, and dietary carbohydrates in your diet every meal and every day. And so that immediately that disproves so many myths that, that you hear out on the interwebs is, oh, you, your brain has to have 120 grams of carbs a day. All that's bullshit, as you know, but, but many people don't know that. They trust tough school of nutrition. They trust Harvard School of Public Health. They trust the, the dietary powers that be in the UK or in Australia or in, in the EU, and they just blindly trust them. And we should be able to do that. But as you know, currently, uh, you, you're not able to trust these associations and organizations because they're wrong about so many things. And so that lowering of the carbohydrates is going to help your, fat, your fat, fasting insulin level go back to low normal. It's going to help your blood sugar levels go back to low normal. It's going to help your hemoglobin A1C, your C-peptide, your triglycerides, all of these things go back to low normal. If you have fatty liver, it's going to reverse that in, in a few weeks to a few months. <clears throat> if you have prediabetes, it's going to reverse that in one to six months. If you have type two diabetes, it's going to reverse that in three to 12 months. And so you're going to get this almost immediate feedback from your physiology that, yes, this is the way. The carnivore is the way. This is what you need to be doing if you'd like to reverse chronic health conditions and, and chronic medical diseases. Now, I have to ask this question because you went uh, before and said polyphenols. The yes. biggest debate in polyphenols is honey. Do you think honey is safe on carnivore or is it dangerous on carnivore? I know your answer, but you got to say it. You got to say it. Yeah, I think that honey used sparingly and rarely is safe. I don't think there's any acute danger from ingesting honey, but we have to be very blunt about this because honey is one of the foods that has taken on magical properties, magical beliefs, right? For all humans, we all believe that some honey is somehow magical because it does seem magical. It's like, so you're telling me that bees, eat, they eat pollen and then they vomit out honey and then we eat it and it tastes delicious. And then also there's these magical health benefits, right? Especially the more expensive honeys like Manuka and others. It's like, oh no, there's research that proves, no, actually there's observational research that shows a possible association, but there's not a shred of research that proves that honey is in any way good for you or necessary 
whatsoever. Now, hunt the, the sugar makeup of honey, honey is, is a very high percentage of fructose. And then there is also some glucose and sucrose that comes naturally in honey. Now, the, one of the first things people need to understand is that honey is very, very commonly adulterated. And so uh, the, the man, either the manufacturer or the middleman can add corn syrup to the honey. And you literally have to have a biochemical lab and do thousands of dollars worth of testing to be able to detect that. Some people think they can detect it with their tongue. Maybe some few people can, but the vast majority of people, they have no idea is this real honey or not. So that's a huge thing, especially in the United States. So I think there was a recent article that showed that well over 30% of the honey on the shelf had been adulterated. The cheaper the brand, the more likely it was to be adulterated, but even some of the more expensive brands as well. And so now let's talk about glycation. This is very, very important. Uh, Dr. Paul Saladino and I recently had a, a, a friendly debate on my YouTube channel about this. Well, it wasn't and, so uh, friendly. It wasn't so friendly, I didn't think. Well, I, I tried to keep it friendly. You were very uh, friendly. Paul, yeah, Paul, was. he's completely wrong about this. And I think if you ask him now, he would admit this because the research is very clear that the tests that we do to check your hemoglobin A1C, to check for glycation, right, and so, first of all, glycation is when sugars inappropriately stick to your cells and your proteins and your tissues, and it gums up how they function. It causes a decrease in function, causes an in increase in inflammation, and it causes an increase in your risk for developing a chronic disease. It's very bad. You don't want to have any unnecessary amount of glycation. Now, the tests for hemoglobin A1C and the test for fructosamine, which is another way to look for glycation, both of these tests, the, the manufacturers, the researchers that actually invented this test, they make it very clear that this only looks for glucose glycation. And what the test actually looks for, both the A1C and the fructosamine, and it, fructosamine has fruc in the, in the name. So you would think maybe it looks for fructose glycation, but it does not. What both of these tests look for is glucose sticking to a particular amino acid, either glycine or leucine, depending on the test. That's what it looks for. And so if you're drinking lots of dairy and getting lots of galactose, galactose is seven to 10 times more glycating, more likely to glycate than glucose. But the A1C test and the fructosamine is blind to that glycation. It cannot detect it. And so for a lot of the people out there who believe that drinking milk or raw, raw milk is, is carnivore and is really good for you and that's a health hack, you are, you are inducing a monstrous amount of glycation in your body that neither the A1C test nor the glucosamine test can detect. So currently, there's no test you can order from Quest or LabCorp or any other lab that can detect how badly you're glycated from the galactose. The same exact thing holds true for fructose as well. Fructose is seven to 10 times more likely to glycate, gum up, cause dysfunction in your cells and tissues and organs than glucose. And the A1C test and the fructose amine test cannot detect the glycation that is caused by fructose. And so if you want to have a teaspoon of honey in your coffee on your birthday and your anniversary and Christmas, I think that's fine. I don't think that's a big deal. But if you are have been deluded into thinking that honey somehow has magical properties or that honey is really good for you and you shouldn't put some in your coffee every day and eat honey every day on purpose, you have been completely deluded. There is no research to support it. And there's ample evidence to show that you are glycating your cells and tissues to a very unhealthy degree, and the test that you would check for glycation cannot detect that glycation. And this is this is not up for debate. This is not my opinion. This is absolutely stated blatantly in the research that was used to get FDA approval for the glucosamine test and for the A1C test. This is not debatable. This is how the test works. So if anyone out there has honey, Dr. Ken Berry is going to come after you. No. We're just joking. But look, no, honey is not good. We shouldn't have honey in any large frequency or quantity because absolutely, as Dr. Canberry said, 
it's not right for you. If you are a beginner to the carnivore diet or you're well on your journey, you might need support. And that's why we have created the ultimate membership group with over 500 carnivores to cheer you on. We have weekly meetings to target fat loss and optimal health, and also weekly guest speaker meetings. And guess who's joining us very soon? Dr. Ken Berry. You'll be able to ask Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and so many other guest speakers your burning questions over a one hour Zoom meeting. You will also get access to our private carnival group with over 1000 members to support you and share meal ideas, tips, and anything that you need to help you along your carnival journey. There is a link in the description where you can get 20% off automatically. All right, let's get back to the interview. Next hack number four to start carnival the right way. What is that? It, I think the next hack is realizing that a carnivore diet is the most uninflammatory diet on the planet. And so if you have chronic inflammation in your joints, in your skin, in your gut, uh, or if you have a, a mental health di diagnosis, very often that comes from chronic inappropriate inflammation. Now, if you sprain your ankle or if you cut your finger, you're going to have acute appropriate inflammation happen immediately at that site. And many people will take an anti-inflammatory ibuprofen, they'll put an ice pack on it, they'll try everything they can to, to fight that acute inflammation. That's actually the first step in the healing process. So if you fight that, you're actually slowing down the healing process. So I would, uh, I would recommend that you don't fight the inflammation from a twisted knee or from a, a, a sprained wrist don't fight that with cold packs, with an ice pack. Don't fight that with anti-inflammatories. <clears throat> That's your body's first step in the healing cascade. But if what you have is chronic, inappropriate inflammation in your joints, in your gut, in your skin, in your brain, then using a carnivore diet is as the most uninflammatory diet on the planet. That's going to that's gonna be a game changer for you. To, and as so many people have said, God, I started carnivore and my, my knee arthritis, it doesn't hurt anymore. My gut issues, my irritable bowel, my Crohn's, whatever, literally I have no symptoms now. Or my psoriasis, my eczema, my keratosis polaris, my acne is so much better on carnivore. How is that possible? It's possible because human beings and our ancestors have been eating meat for over three and a half million years. It is just as ancestrally appropriate to eat meat as it is to breathe air or drink water. Literally, we've been doing all those things for over three and a half million years. And so if anybody tells you that meat is acidic, that meat is inflammatory, that meat is dangerous, that, that would literally be like, you know, the Harvard School of Public Health coming out with a new article saying, oh, you shouldn't drink water you should just drink Coca-Cola and Pepsi because water, it's not safe to drink long term. And we've got some observational research that shows an increased risk of fill in the blank. If you drink water too regularly, we'd much, we really think you should drink fruit juice and Coca-Cola uh, because they're much more modern. They're made in a very clean sanitary factory. Uh, and that we think that would be the better option for you. Everybody would be like, what the hell? What? That's stupid. I'm not doing that. Well, when somebody says that meat is inflammatory, meat causes it makes your system acidic, meat causes cancer, meat causes diverticulitis, diabetes, fatty liver, any of those things, that is just as stupid as saying that drinking pure clean water is bad for you or that drinking, that breathing pure clean air is somehow bad for you. That is just as ignorant of a statement. And so realizing that meat is uninflammatory that's a huge, huge paradigm shift for most people. And, and then they get that again, Rena, they get that immediate feedback from their body. After a few days or a few weeks of eating carnivore, they're like, oh my God, fill in the blank is so much better now. How is that possible? And the focus is the fatty red meat, right? Why is it yes. that ruminant animals are the preference on a carnivore diet? Well, ruminant animals are the that is the cleanest meat you can eat. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And a properly raised and properly treated ruminant animal is just uh, absolutely a healthier choice. Now, 
I am not anti-chicken. I'm not anti-pork. I'm not anti-poultry. I'm not anti-rattlesnake. I think you can eat, I think it's safe and healthy to eat any meat on the planet. If it, if it creeps, crawls, runs, flies, slithers, eat it. I think it's totally fine. Now, if you're eating a poisonous snake, don't eat the, don't eat the venom glands. Of course, that'd be dumb. But the flesh of that animal is absolutely fine for you to eat. Uh, and but the the difference with ruminant animals, and so this would be cows, this would be sheep, goats, uh, camel, water buffalo, bison, uh, reindeer. These are ruminants, and so they have a multi chamber stomach, and they have billions, if not trillions, of bacteria. And so they will they they have a multi step process where they break down inedible plant matter, and in many cases, even if they're fed inappropriate things like grains. Uh, leftover skittles that that literally happens to to cafo fed animals they're just given like expired candy and expired uh, off the shelf products that are high in sugar they can still take that and even though it harms their health as an animal they're able to turn that into delicious nutritious healthy uninflammatory fatty red meat and I think it's very interesting that humans, when we when we contain animals and we feed them these inappropriate diets to make them have marbling and to make them more fatty, what we're actually doing is we're we're mimicking, we're echoing the megafauna that we used to have access to on planet Earth before twelve to fifteen thousand years ago. We had access to these animals that were naturally fatty. We didn't have to feed them an inappropriate species diet to fatten them up. They just ran around and we could chase them down. Uh, but we don't have that anymore. And so we we have to mimic that. It's almost like our, our ancestral heritage. We just know you want the meat to be as fatty as possible because that's going to taste better. And in, in an ancestral setting, if something tastes better, that means it's better for you, right? Because our tongues are the products of millions of years of evolution. They're not going to mislead you in a natural setting. But in an artificial setting, like our modern food culture, your tongue can very readily mislead you because these are not ancestrally appropriate things that we have access to. And so I think that once people understand that, that makes it much easier to switch to carnivore, makes it make sense. It makes it, it's like common sense at that point. You're like, well, hell, why, how, how did I not know this all along? And then it also makes it more sustainable because when you do hear the 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 fear mongering new news article, oh God, just on CNN they said this. Oh my God, on you know Fox News they just said this. There's a new article in Time Magazine or Newsweek or whatever. You're like, that's bullshit. That makes no sense whatsoever from an ancestral perspective. I'm not even gonna. I'm not gonna let that get my heart rate up. I'm just gonna laugh at that. And indeed, that's what many people in our private group. They literally will post an article that was just published in Scientific American. And they'll be like, look at this stupid shit. Can you believe that there are people that still believe this? Like it's a joke now when they publish this stuff from the Tufts School of Nutrition. Oh, really? Lucky Charms are is healthier than a egg scrambled in butter. Really? Uh, beef is worse than, um, I think, yeah, Lucky Charms or cereals or, or like something yep. ridiculous was crazy. I was just like, what? yeah, it's just, yep. how is this even... How is this even possible and how do people believe it? Yeah, it's very fascinating to watch this play out because I'm I'm very certain that the plant-based movement, the the plant-based meat, the lucky charms is better than for you than than ground beef or an egg scrambled in butter. That's idiotic. Okay, first of all, that makes no sense whatsoever evolutionarily. There's no research that even supports that. That that's actually causation research, right? That's randomized control research. So this is going to die. It's a it's going to go on for a while. But I think many many conservative minded people for for eons have said if something is ignorant and it makes no sense and it and it, it doesn't benefit anybody, then it's going to die. It may not die today, but it's going to die because things that can't go on won't go on. They will stop. And so this is all going to stop. They're going to try very hard. They're going to spend millions, if not billions of dollars promoting this because uh, you once you understand that a plant-based diet is easy to scale up, you can take ground up grains or seeds or ground up plants and you can make anything out of them product-wise. 
you can take grains and, and vegetable seed oils and a little bit of sugar and a little bit of salt, and you can make everything from a bagel to a pizza crust to a donut to a birthday cake to, a, you know, flan. You can make all everything with it. It's shelf stable. You make a huge percentage profit markup. You can ship it all over the world, right? Uh, you don't have to worry about bacteria and rats and mice eating it because they don't consider it food. So they'll leave it alone. And so you get to make all this profit from this food-like product, which is not a real food. It's a starvation food. But, it, but if what you're looking for is to optimize your health, you do that by optimizing your diet. And you don't eat starvation foods to optimize your health. You eat optimization foods. And that's what a, a carnivore diet is. So I was curious to know, so I posted it on, on my Twitter, what would happen to the world if the world went carnivore? Yeah. Yeah. Can is you just imagine? Question, yeah, that well, a that's a question. That's a like, I was just curious, like it popped in my mind because I speak to my partner about this all the time, like why people don't understand the premise of a carnivore diet. How can they think that red meat is so bad? How can they think that I'm eating butter? Oh my God, what are you doing? It's like, well, this is natural. What What are you eating? And it's that the idea of, even for you, I'll ask you the question, what would happen if the world went carnival? Yeah. So within, within just a few days, there would be a food shortage if a carnivore diet were to be, let's just say there was a, 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 an alien species came and they just took over the world and said, you will eat the following things. That's it. And otherwise we'll vaporize you instantly. We don't, we're not currently, we're not producing enough meat and eggs around the world because it's, it's been, it's been, uh, you know, declared very unsexy to eat meat. It's very unhealthy to eat meat. And so meat production and egg production has actually been declining. And if, if the plant-based uh, people had their way, it would decline even further. But as soon as we were able to scale back up and we had everybody in the United States and the UK and EU and Australia and Turkey. We had everybody had some quail in the garage for eggs and meat. They had some chickens in the backyard for eggs and meat. They had, if they have a few acres of, of property, they had a few sheep grazing, or if they have enough property, they have some cattle grazing. Once we scaled that back up so that everybody had animals to some level in their environment, uh, what, what you would notice is that the rate of type 2 diabetes would plummet, okay? It would, within three to 12 months, there would be virtually no one left with type 2 diabetes. It just wouldn't exist anymore. The people with type 1 diabetes would be using 80 to 90% less insulin, and they would also have a normal hemoglobin A1C, Right. People with hypertension would notice that they would, within a few months, they'd be able to come off all of their medication. Their blood pressure would be normal. Or a, a very few people might be left with just a low dose of one blood pressure medication to keep their blood pressure technically normal. Uh, people with fatty liver, within one to six months, there would be nobody with fatty liver disease unless they were still drinking alcohol. It just it would be gone. The non-alcoholic fatty liver would just be gone right? People with psoriasis would notice that they don't need nearly as much medication anymore. Their psoriasis is either completely gone or they've got one little spot somewhere that doesn't really bother them at all. Uh, people with eczema, it would just be gone. Within one to six months, they would have no eczema whatsoever. This also goes for childhood eczema as well, because we'd be feeding our children a carnivore diet as well. Now, what would that do? So uh, there would be multiple billion dollar corporations whose main products are that are, are based on grains and sugar and vegetable seed oils, there would be millions of people unemployed. There would be billions of dollars of profit lost. Then we, let's talk about the big pharmaceutical houses. The only reason that they're able to make the billions of dollars that they're able to make is because people have chronic metabolic conditions, chronic inflammatory conditions. All of those conditions are going to get drastically better or go completely away. So now you're talking about billions of dollars and millions of jobs lost from the big pharma sector. Yes, absolutely. Now let's talk about medicine. How many endocrinologists are there in the world today? These are people who specialized in basically type 2 diabetes and, and type 1 diabetes. That's the bulk of their practice. Instead of in, in a, let's say, a city like Nashville or Tennessee or Austin, Texas, where there may be 40 or 50 endocrinologists, 
you're going to need one endocrinologist in that city now. Uh, when it comes to orthopedic surgeons, and I think Sean Baker would verify this, you're going to need one or two orthopedic surgeons in town because you're not going to be doing knee replacements and hip replacements and shoulder replacements and thumb joint replacements because all those chronic inflammatory conditions are going to improve. They may still have damage on an x-ray, you can see, but they don't have pain anymore or disability. And they're like, I don't need surgery. The only thing you'll need an orthopedic surgeon for is if somebody gets hit by a bus or falls off a roof, right, or gets in a fight and, and gets a bone broken, you'll need them for that. You'll need them for, for some childhood orthopedic conditions, but that's it. So Austin, Texas, they'll have one or two orthopedic surgeons. Nashville, Tennessee, one or two orthopedic surgeons. What about family physicians? Because the vast majority of what a family physician or a generalist, a GP does, is colds and flus and sinus infection and bronchitis, all that stops happening. It, it becomes very, very rare for you to get sick with that thing you used to get sick six times a year. Now you get it once a year, maybe, and it's so mild, you don't even have to go to the doctor. Hypertension's been cut by 90%. Type 2 diabetes has been cut by 95%. Everything that a, a family doctor or GP used to be useful for, there's Nobody has that anymore. And so they they maybe they went from having 5,000 patients down to having 50 or 100 patients who still need them for a specific disease that is actually genetic or is actually there's just there's no dietary cause for that. So they've, they, they've went from 5,000 patient panel down to a 100 patient panel. So they're going to have to find a part time job. And then now with with AI coming, I, mm -hmm. I would highly predict every primary care or health healthcare provider out there, whether you're an MD, a DO, or a PA, or an NP, you probably need to be going back to school. Uh, you probably, because as carnivore becomes more popular, and as AI becomes more ubiquitous, uh, you, my friend, are going to be looking for work is what's going to happen if you're a GP or, or a primary care healthcare provider. You probably need to go back to school to be something else. And don't go back to school to be something else that AI is also good at. That would be dumb. So, uh, yeah, that that's coming. But, yeah, if everybody went carnivore, it would it would cause just the destruction of a huge percentage of the, the billion-dollar corporations. But it would also spur local economies all across the world. You're going to have farmers markets and ranchers markets all over the world, and so up in Russia, you're going to have you're going to have fatty reindeer meat that everybody has access to. In in Australia, you're going to have fatty kangaroo meat that everybody has access to. They're not ruminants, but I still think that they're much better than eating Doritos, right? And so, the, and no matter where you're at in the world, whatever species of megafauna is indigenous still to that, you're gonna you're gonna have that. And so in Asia, you're gonna have water buffalo and all the other me megafauna that are still there, everybody's going to be raising them or, or at least hunting them and encouraging their natural hab habitat to, to increase in size so that they can reproduce and, and have bigger numbers. It, it's like, it would be like a spontaneous explosion of local agriculture, local ranching, and then also reinforcing the natural habitat so that the, whatever megafauna is indigenous to where you live, you're immediately going to become very interested, not sending $100 to the World Wildlife Fund. You're going to literally be out there in the woods planting some kind of bush that will grow some fruit or some leaves that, that your megafauna wants to eat and needs. You're going to be out there doing that because immediately you're very interested and like in here in Tennessee, we have white-tailed deer and we have wild turkey. That's probably the only two bigger things that we have. And so you're going to be out there planting apple trees in the woods because you want to feed those deer. You don't want them to starve over the winter. You want there to be a huge deer population here so that people, either you can hunt them or other people can hunt them and then you can trade for that meat. Can you imagine what that would do to the local economy, the, just the, the power of just the average family? to have an economic means of support and a way of, of, of supporting their local neighbors. Saying, oh, you've got quail eggs. Okay, I'll trade you this for that, or I'll buy those from you. Oh, you've got chickens in the backyard. Oh my God, I, you know, I, want some, I want some pasture chicken eggs. Oh, you've got cattle? Oh my God, I want some, right? Oh, you've got lamb, oh my God. Just literally that, that rippling through our society. I feel like that that would do nothing bad to our society, 
and would do thousands of things good for our society. And I, I hope that's the way we're headed. I feel like it is the way we're headed with the work that you're doing and others in the space. And, and you, I'm, and you. Yeah, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited. I'm excited about the future and what that's going to bring is as we rejuvenate and, and basically regrow our local economies around a, a meat forward, a meat centric, a meat heavy, a carnivore diet. I couldn't be more excited. Even the likes of Ray Dalio says changing world order. I feel like that is what's happening now with the external environment, with the economy, but almost with carnival. Almost yes. that could be the way if more people watching right now, they went carnival, they started it the right way. Don't for, go, don't go for the lean meats. Don't go for the expensive this. Keep it local. Help your farmers. Even you told me a story or somebody told me a story about, you know, farmers are going out of business. We all see this. And if we change it and if we do it from the ground up with people, like it's just glorious what the outcome could be. And I know, and I can see that you're so passionate about it. I am because I, I, I do think it is the paradigm shift that is going to save the world. It's going to change the world. Uh, if we just sit by passively and continue to be consumers of what big food gives us and what big pharma gives us and what mainstream news media gives us, and we don't start to act at a local level, it's going to be bad. It's going to get really, really bad. And I think there are many people out there who are completely disillusioned with big medicine and big pharma and big food. This is all a game. They just want my wallet. They literally could not care less about my health. And especially the events of the last three years, I think people who were completely had, had drank the Kool-Aid had just, they're just like, no, if, if, the, if the CDC says it, that's gospel. Don't even question it. I think there are millions of those people now going, what the hell? So if, if I can't trust that, important question here, what else can I not trust? Everything. Perhaps, right? But, and so that makes many people very uncomfortable, but I would opine that that is the place that a, that a mentally healthy, physically healthy homo sapien sapien, that should be your comfort zone, is where you question everything. Even if your mama tells you something's good to eat, you may smile and nod because that's your mama. Show some respect. But at the same time, you're going to be like, is it really? I need to think about that. I need to do an internet search. I need to, let me think about that. Does Dr. Barry have a video about that? Right. And so we need to question everything. That is why we are the apex species on the planet is because we have the ability to question everything. We have the ability to innovate anything. We can take any rock, any stick, any leaf, any hide, and we can use it to build something, to make something. Or we can take something that somebody else has made and make it a little bit better. Right. That's our superpower. This is our superpower, and it's time that so many people stop being mentally lazy. Remember what, what your birthright is as a, as a human being. It's this big, beautiful brain between your ears, and if you're not using that, then you're absolutely part of the problem. You are not part of the solution. And most people, unfortunately, don't use their brain. Not to say anything bad, but most people just, even Jordan Peterson was saying, why are people getting so dumb? And he was saying that it's not... Um, it's not some it's it's the carbohydrates or something. It's what you're eating. It's what we're eating that's making us so dumb because people don't think. People don't have an opinion. People are brainwashed. And why are we brainwashed? Because everything that you're saying. So absolutely. I could not agree more completely. Now, what is hack number five about how to start carnival? The right I've way. I've lost my place. I don't know. Where are we even at? So another another hack. Yeah. So one a lot of people are confused by what carnivore even means. And so many people who are eating a plant-based diet, a highly inflammatory, high carbohydrate diet, they've been avoiding meat. And so they think a carnivore diet means that you're eating some meat. And so they'll add back in some fish or chicken or something to their, their vegan or vegetarian diet. And then after a few weeks of that, they're like, I don't really feel any better. I don't feel any different. So then they'll say, oh, I tried carnivore. It didn't work for me. And so one thing that you have to understand is carnivore is an elimination diet. To be a true carnivore, at least for the first 90 days, you need to eat nothing but meat. 
and maybe eggs with the yolk and maybe some butter and ghee or ghee, just the, the fat component of dairy, not the protein, not the sugar part of dairy and do that for 90 days. Then you can make a meaningful assessment of did carnivore improve anything for me or not. But a lot of people don't understand this. Carnivore is getting very popular. You have millions of people out there who don't think about diet or nutrition at all. They don't even know what a, what the three macronutrients are. They don't, they don't know that. They don't know it and they don't care. But they keep hearing about this carnivore diet. And they're like, oh, okay, so I'm going to start eating some chicken with my plant-based diet. Or I'm going to start to have some grass-fed, grass-finished panda massage you know, beef with just maybe, but maybe just two ounces because, you know, meat's inflammatory and it causes diabetes. Well, they haven't heard the full message. They're just seeing the hashtag and they're seeing the, 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 the shorts and the reels and the TikToks, but they're not doing the research because they don't give a damn about nutrition and the facts about it. And so that's why we need more people like you and more people like the people in our private community who have started a YouTube channel or started and Instagram, just talking about nutrition. Because human beings are, as a matter of fact, the only species of mammal on the planet that's confused about what it should eat. No other mammal has this problem. They A cow knows exactly what they should eat and what they should avoid. And they know how much to eat and they know when to eat and they know when to stop eating. You don't have to tell them. They don't have to take a course. They don't have to sign up for, for something. They don't have to take, they don't have to do any of that. They just eat when they're hungry and they stop eating when they're full. They know what to eat and what to avoid. Humans, the smartest, arguably the smartest mammal on the planet, has the most trouble with this. And that's because of the profit motive. There are people trying to make a buck off what you eat and what you don't eat. By, whether by selling the food or selling the book that tells you what to eat or selling the supplement because you're not eating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that that's a huge thing for people is to understand the complete argument for carnivore. It's not just adding some meat to your high carb inflammatory diet. That's not carnivore. Carnivore is the complete elimination of all things carbohydrate and all things inflammatory and so uh, how we get that message out to the masses so that we don't have hundreds of thousands of people saying, oh, I tried carnivore. It didn't help me a bit. I didn't feel any better at all. And that's because they added two ounces of, of beef to their once a week to their diet and they couldn't tell any difference. It, this is kind of like the alcoholic who's drinking, you know, three liters of, of liquor a day. And they say, well, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop drinking beer and I'm going to eat two ounces of beef a day. Is that alcoholic going to feel any different? Oh, no. they're still an alcoholic. They're still poisoning their body. It's only when you remove all the alcohol and you just add back in water and meat does that alcoholic, after the DT process, they, they feel miraculously better. And that's what happens if you're on a plant-based inflammatory diet. You can't just add a little bit of meat back. You have to go carnivore for 90 days. And then you can you can experiment with adding things back or not. But I think there's thousands, millions of people out there that don't understand that one key concept about carnivores. So we need to be, keep getting the word out like we're all trying to do so that people know how to do carnivore right. I think the next tip or hack could be tip number six, because you said um, you need to go carnivore only meat for 30, 60, 90 days. Can you have coffee? Yeah. So this is a this is a great argument in the carnivore community. First of all, let's talk about it from a, 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 a humanity aspect. There's been tons of research done over the la over the decades trying to prove that coffee is bad for you because uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, who basically they have abducted nutrition science, they believe that coffee is bad and you should not ever drink coffee. And so that you keep seeing these research articles and all that. And so, but let me sum up the totality of this because I love coffee and I, if it's bad for me, I want to know because I will bite the bullet and stop coffee. We can't as in medical and nutrition science, we cannot even prove that coffee is bad for pregnant women. We cannot prove that it's bad for young children. Like literally you cannot, it, there is no, no research proving that it is bad. Even for people with heart failure, even for people with end stage kidney or liver you can't prove it's unhealthy or bad. So there's that, number one. Next is 
How many people around the world drink coffee? Virtually all of them, right? So if it were truly unhealthy, truly bad, we would see us a big signal in the observational data. It wouldn't be a 1.15 hazard ratio. It would be a 10 or a 12 hazard ratio. And we go, oh my God, that we really need to do some control research on that. That looks really bad. That's how we figured out that cigarette smoking was bad for us is because in the observational research, the, the hazard ratio was 20 or 30 or 200, not 1.18. Right. And so it was such a signal in the observational data. We were like, shit, that's really bad. We need to investigate that with control studies. And now we know with definitively smoking cigarettes is bad for you. Don't do that. But so billions of people drink coffee or tea every single day. Now, coffee and tea have caffeine, but they also have hundreds, if not thousands of other polyphenols. And are polyphenols good or bad for us? I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but there could be some polyphenols that are good for us. Well, guess how I get my polyphenols? I get them from drinking coffee. Coffee is one of the richest sources of polyphenol. And so if anybody still believes in the polyphenol argument, drink coffee every day. You'll get, you'll get thousands of polyphenols in just the right dosage. Uh, but many people now believe in the carnivore community that any poly polyphenol, any phytochemical is by definition bad for you. Well, I would ask, I would ask my brothers and sisters in the carnivore community, is there any definitive evidence proving that the polyphenols in coffee are bad for you? I don't think so. I haven't seen it. If, if there is, I would love to see the research. Send me a link ASAP on my Twitter. Uh, send me a link on my Instagram because I'd love to see that definitive research concluding that coffee has is, is been shown to cause the following thing because I don't think that exists. I think these people are using the same observational data that people used to show that meat was bad. And so I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the farm on that. Now, I've done a 90-day no caffeine experiment. I've done a 30-day no coffee experiment. I Other than I noticed two things. First of all, I had some, I had some withdrawals. Yes. Ca caffeine is a habit forming. There's a hundred percent. I don't think anybody argues that it's not, but you can just like tobacco, just like alcohol, you can break that addiction. It sucks for a few days. You have a headache. You feel kind of tired for a few days. I weaned it down very slowly. So I didn't have severe symptoms. Yes. It's, it's habit forming. There's no doubt about that. Does that mean that by definition that makes it bad? I don't think we know that for a fact. I have since reintroduced coffee and caffeine back into my diet. I can't tell any benefit of not drinking coffee. I can't tell any benefit of drinking coffee. Literally no difference in my overall health mentally or physically. Uh, so then I get to default back to, I freaking love coffee. Therefore, I'm going to have a cup or, uh, or two of coffee a day. Uh, but there's all these arguments. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's bad. So I know what people are going to be thinking that um, we hear two sides of the story, especially for, for carnivores. And I did an interview with Dr. Anthony Chafee two weeks ago. I'm sure, sure you know his stance with Dr. Chafee. Sure. And he's anti-coffee because it's a plant toxin. There sure. was over 500 comments on that video saying, I love my coffee, I love my coffee, I love my coffee. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of Dr. Chafee's uh, thoughts about coffee? So a very important concept when you start talking about human nutrition, human physiology, human health, is you have to understand this thing called the normal distribution curve. And this applies to every single facet of mammalian physiology, including humans. And so there's, so on this normal distribution curve, over on this side are people who are so unaffected by the phytonutrients and polyphenols in coffee or anything else, they could drink a gallon of coffee a day at bedtime. They're not going to be affected at all in any negative way that they can detect. The vast majority of people in the fat part of this normal distribution curve, these people, if they drink a little coffee, they literally have no negative effect whatsoever. If they drink too much coffee, they might get jittery or have insomnia. But if they have a cup or two in the morning, it's literally nothing. It's a nothing burger. Then over on this side of the curve, there are people that if they drink any coffee, at all, they're going to have an inflammatory response, either in their gut, their skin, their, their joints. They're going to have severe insomnia. They may, they may be slow metabolizers of caffeine. So even that morning cup of coffee, they're not going to be able to sleep that night as well. Uh, there are many, the, like I said earlier, there are thousands of polyphenols. 
in a cup of coffee. It's not just the caffeine. There's also theobromine, theophylline, and thousands of other polyphenols, phytonutrients or phytotoxins, phytochemicals, right? However you want to phrase it. But some people are very sensitive to those. So for the vast majority of people, I don't think that coffee's a toxin. I don't think coffee's a poison. <clears throat> but how are you going to know that if you don't do the 30 days? And so I, even though I love coffee and I'm going to drink it, I've done my 30 days of no coffee. I've done my 90 days of no caffeine, right? So I know for a fact with my N equals one experiment, that I'm not over here on this part of the curve. I'm somewhere between here and here. Coffee does not bother me. Now, if I have co ca coffee after 2 p.m., I'm not going to sleep. And I, I know that. So I have two cups in the morning and that's it. I don't touch it uh, the rest of the day. The, so Now, Nisha, my wife, my beautiful wife, she can drink a, cup, a, a double espresso at bedtime in bed and then go to bed and sleep like a baby. It, I don't know if she's a fast metabolizer or if it just doesn't affect her. It does not bother her sleep whatsoever. And she's got, she's had the ring. She's got the, the watch. We track our sleep. We, so I'm not, I'm not just speaking out of my ass here. I'm, we, we track this stuff. It doesn't affect her. She's over here. She's one of these people, right? Is it because she has Puerto, Puerto Rican heritage? I don't know. I'm a, I'm a white boy. I'm a redneck. And so I know that if I have too much coffee, I'm going to pay for that later in the day. But I think there are many people who can have a cup or two of coffee a day, and it's literally inconsequential to their overall health. And then let's finish with this, Rena. It's very easy to major in a minor. And what the, what I mean by that is you get all up in arms about caffeine or, or coffee and ignore all the honey you're eating every day or ignore all the milk you're eating, drinking every day. So you've got this huge 80% problem that's – harming your health definitively, inarguably. You are you drink a, a, a quart of raw milk a day and you're eating, you know, a half cup of honey a day. You are destroying your health, but you're over here pissed off and arguing about coffee. You need to stop that, okay? Coffee is at, at worst a 20% problem, but for the vast majority of people, I think it's probably a 1% or 2% problem. It's not a big deal. It's not a major problem. It's a minor problem. But you're over here majoring in this minor while you continue to harm your health. And we all we all are liable to do that. We're all susceptible to that if we blindly believe any guru, any authority, any influencer, any regulatory body, any university, if you blindly believe and follow anyone, you're liable to fall into that trap. And so that's why I've said hundreds of times on social media, do not blindly believe me about anything. Do your own experiment, do your 30 days, do your 90 days. Then you absolutely know definitively, is it a yes or no for you? Is it a major problem for you or is it a minor problem for you? You've got to be thinking, you've got to be reading, you've got to be doing your N equals one experiments or you'll never know your true answer. You're just blindly following this guy or this chick and you don't know shit about shit in the in the ultimate reality of the situation so another thing that is so similar to to the coffee thing majoring in the minor which is hack or tip number seven which is how much fat sh uh, should we be eating 80 20 70 30 90 10 yep <laughs> what i do think you everybody should start their carnivore diet with a one-to-one -one fat to pro to protein ratio not in macros but in ounce per ounce what you eat uh, an ounce of red meat an ounce of the fat right? One-to-one, -one, that's the great place for everybody to start. Now, for some very few people, that may be too high in fat initially. If they don't have a gallbladder, if they have gallbladder problems, if, if they have other issues going on, that may be too much fat initially. But I don't think for any human on the planet, that's too much fat. That's a dangerous amount of fat. I do not, I don't see any research supporting that opinion. Now, I, there are some people who do great on a high-protein adequate fat diet for weight loss for other issues they do great on that but in my experience the vast majority of people the 80 percent do better on a higher fat yet adequate protein carnivore diet now some people bump the fat up to 80 percent and they do great they lose weight like like gangbusters they're reversing chronic medical conditions they feel better they sleep better their, their mental capacity is better. 
Other people, that seems to be too much fat for them. So again, the normal distribution curve applies to that question as well. And so I don't think you can make a blanket statement. You should never eat this much fat or you should always eat this much fat. I don't think you know the answer to that unless you've done your 30, 60 or 90 days. And it also could change depending on where you're at in your journey. And so let's take an example. A woman is overweight. She wants to lose weight. She doesn't have a gallbladder. Should she, so, okay, so should, she, should she start with 80-20, fat to protein? Maybe, if she can stomach it, but that may give her severe gastrointestinal symptoms for a few days or a few weeks. Is that going to turn her off to keto? Is she going to say, oh, I mean carnivore. Oh, carnivore didn't work for me. I couldn't tolerate it. And then she goes back to her standard American diet. Have we won or have we lost in that situation, right? So what if she started at a one-to-one? -one? She had just a few days of GI distress, and then it was gone. Then she now she's eating carnivore. Is that better than a standard American diet? Hell yes. Now she can play around. Let me bump the fat up. Let me bump the protein up. I don't know why people want to become apostolic. I don't know why people want to become immediately proselytizers and, and, and carnivore police and carnivore Nazis. I think it's just inherent in some people to, to take on that persona, but it's not helpful. And so if you feel yourself being a militant about any particular thing in, in carnivore or ketovore or keto, stop that. You're not helping anybody. Nobody wants to hear that shit, first of all. And secondly, there's a normal distribution curve that you may be currently ignorant of. You may not know that there's such a concept in human physiology and nutrition. So you need to shut up with, with the carnivore Nazi crap and let people experiment. Let them try stuff. Because I promise you, when they find their sweet spot on the fat to protein, on the ruminant versus poultry, on the, the ruminant versus seafood, I would not be surprised if there are people from certain ethnic backgrounds with certain DNA who do better on a seafood heavy carnivore diet. That would not surprise me in the least. And they can have ruminant meat and it's totally fine, but they feel their best when they're eating fatty seafood. And, and crustaceans and mollusks, and they, they just feel better. That would not surprise me at all. So let's be less dogmatic about our beliefs. Let's be less militant about our beliefs. Uh, look, we, you can be dogmatic and militant about carnivore is the best way for the vast majority of people. Yes, 100%. Don't shut up saying that. But if you're then now you wanting to niche down and you found what works for you, my friend, that may not work for everybody. That may not be where their carnivore diet needs to be. So be a little more understanding, a little more accepting, and a little less dogmatic. That's just like the the, the honey and the fruit question with some of our carnivore-ish brothers and sisters. I would never do that myself. I would never give Beckett a, a, a carnivore-ish or a super carnivore diet that's rich in fruit and honey. I would not do that to him because I love him and I want the best health for him. But these people, they seem to be getting benefits from that right now. And outside of the hidden glycation that they can't detect, maybe that's where they need to be right now. But I don't think that's a, a safe place for them to, to hang out long term. Does that make sense? And so let's be met less militant and Nazi-like within the carnivore community. But when it comes to proselytizing a proper human diet, let's never shut up doing that to people who are currently eating the standard high-carb, high highly inflammatory crap. Let's never stop trying to help pull them under the huge tent that, that, that protects the proper human diet community. So tip number eight, what do you think of supplements? So depending on where you live in the world, how much sun you get, what uh, if you have access to seafood or not, there are a few supplements that that may be absolutely vital for you, right? Uh, there are places on, on the interior of the large continents of the world <clears throat> that are considered gorder belts. There's just not enough iodine in the soil. And so if you live too far from a coastline of, of a saltwater ocean or sea, or lake, there's not going to be any iodine in the soil. And so indeed, back in World War I, this is why the United States started to put salt, started to put iodine in salt. They convinced the manufacturers to do that because there were so many 
17, 18, 19 year old young men from the middle of our continent who had a huge gorder because they had no iodine in their diet. So they couldn't, they couldn't be drafted or they couldn't enlist in military service. And so they started to put iodine in the salt for that very reason. And that's true of any continent on the planet. If there's not a source of iodine near you, you probably need to supplement iodine. And I've got several videos on my YouTube channel about iodine because it's super, super important to overall health and optimization. It's not just for your thyroid. Every cell in the human body that's ever been studied has a sodium iodine symporter, which is a little machine on the cell membrane that pulls iodine actively into the cell. Cells don't do that. They don't waste that energy unless that cell needs the iodine. So iodine's a big one. Now, if you're eating seafood several times a week, you don't need to supplement iodine, right? The next one is vitamin D. If you live at a latitude where you can get ample vitamin D, and very importantly, and if you run around outside with enough skin exposed, so you can get the vitamin D, so you can make the vitamin D from your cholesterol, then you don't need to take a supplement. And so here in Tennessee in the winter, I'm outside in my short sleeves or with my shirt off and my shorts. I get plenty of vitamin D. I don't take a supplement during the summer. But in the, the late fall, the winter and the early spring, there's no way at this latitude to get enough vitamin D from the sun. So I eat vitamin D rich foods. I've got a YouTube video about that if anybody doesn't know what those are. And I take a vitamin D K2 supplement during those months where I can't get enough vitamin D from production from sunlight. And so I think everybody should be worried about that. If you live at a, at a, at a northern enough latitude or a southern enough latitude, you're not getting the UV radiation that you need to, to produce vitamin D. You need to take a supplement. Um, another one that maybe our older carnivores need to think about is coenzyme Q10 or ubiquinol. As you get older, you tend to make less. It does many, many very important things in the body. Now, I think that carnivores are going to have a higher CoQ10 level in their blood than people eating a crap diet. But is it high enough? I don't think we know from the research yet because there's not enough carnivore diet research out there to know. Does it raise it high enough? For some people, a carnivore diet raises their testosterone levels for men anywhere from 50 to 400 points. And so many men who are considering TRT, thyroid replacement therapy, if they just went carnivore, that's free. They just start making the testosterone again and, and, and all the benefits that come with that gentleman. Some guys, they just, even though they're strict carnivore, they still need, a, you could call it a testosterone supplement. They need TRT to get it up where they feel their best. Same goes for women and testosterone and, S and progesterone. Some women, when they go carnivore, their levels go to beautiful, optimal. Others, they need to supplement with some bioidenticals just to get it up where it needs to be so they feel their best and they don't have to act their age because nobody wants to act their age, right? Am I right about that? Yep, absolutely. Uh, there, there, are several, there are several other supplements that, that there could be an argument made that you may need to supplement with that, at least initially, maybe long-term, depending on where you live in the world and what uh, some people hate seafood, right? So they're never, uh, if and, and so therefore, if they're eating a ruminant-based diet where the cows graze in the middle of a large continent, not near any ocean, it's highly likely they're going to be deficient in iodine because if the iodine is not in the soil, it cannot get into the grass. Therefore, it cannot get into the cow or the sheep or the goat. And although ruminants are amazing, magical creatures, they cannot... They cannot perform nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. They cannot produce iodine. It's either in the soil, in the grass, or they don't have it in their body. And that's very important for people to understand. Okay. Second last one. What would you tell new carnivores about exercise? Yeah. So exercise is good for your body in hundreds of ways. It's good for your brain. It's good for many, many, many things. But the place where we all got diluted and confused, and that's why I talk about exercise in the way that I do, is we were convinced that exercise is a great way to lose weight, right? If you're trying to lose weight, then you need to join the gym. And the research shows very clearly that that's horseshit. Now, horseshit is a technical term we use here in the southern United States that means it's, it's, it's something that people tell you to try to trick you. 
It's different. It's, it's different subtly than bullshit. Bullshit's just something that's stupid. Horseshit is stupid, but they're trying to trick you with it. That's the difference in the two. And so there, there is no research that that shows that exercising is a good method of fat loss. And so many people coming to keto and carnivore, they're 100 pounds overweight. They're 200, 300, 400 pounds overweight. You're going to tell that person to join the gym, start doing CrossFit, start doing, no, they're going to immediately injure themselves. Also, they feel like crap. They have no energy. They, they, if you tell them to exercise, what are they going to do, Raina? They're going to give up. They're like, well, shit, I can't do that. I can barely get off the couch. But what they can do the first day is they can fix their diet. Because you can eat carnivore laying on the sofa. You can eat carnivore lying in the recliner, right? And so as you start, as you fix your diet, so this is an 80-20 problem again. 80 to 90% of the problem is your diet. Maybe 10 to 20% of your problem is you're not exercising enough. It is a problem, but it's not the 80%. So I, I want people, when they first come to Carnivore, to I want all of your effort, all of your motivation, all of your willpower, and all of your money to be spent on diet. Fix your diet. Buy the best quality meat that you can afford. If all you can afford is bologna and hot dogs and spam, that's way the hell better than the shit you were eating before. But if you can afford better, then do better. But spend all of your resources, all of your mo motivation, your stick to your all that on the diet. Focus on that 100% for at least the first 90 days. And then what happens, Rena, is naturally after about 90 days of carnivore, people are like, dude, I feel freaking amazing. Yeah. I think I'm going to. Go for a walk, go for a swim, go for a bike ride. It's like exercise is just part of our natural behavior as homo sapiens sapien if we feel like it. If we feel good and if, our, if we're not inflamed and if we're not depressed and if we're not 300 pounds overweight, we're going to go outside and play. You almost can't keep us from doing that. But if we're fat and miserable and inflamed and depressed, don't talk about exercise. That's not productive. That's not going to help them succeed. But when you fix that diet strictly enough for long enough, human beings by nature want to go outside and play. You don't have to yell at them and berate them and scold them anymore. You have to go look for them because they're outside playing. Absolutely. Now, the last one is going to be very much like exercise. The 20% of the 80 of the 100% fasting. So I, fasting is something that human beings have been doing. There is no debate about this. Humans have been fasting for millions of years. Every major religion that, that it, if you talk about them before they tried to streamline and mainstream become less weird, there was a huge component of fasting in, the, in every major religion without exception. Fasting was a big part of their religious practice. Now, I don't think, I think there are some religious reasons for that, like, you know, asceticism, trying to sacrifice. Yes, yes, yes. But there are also, it's obvious that there are health benefits from fasting. Now, this may be, when you say the word fasting, that's a very loaded word because some people think of, oh, okay, I'm just going to skip breakfast. That's my fast. I agree. That's a fast. And I think that has a beneficial physiological benefit. For other people, if you say fast, they're thinking about Ramadan. They're thinking about doing a 10-day water-only fast or a three-day dry fast. Everybody has a different definition. I think there might be a place for all those things in as part of a proper human diet. But I don't think they're mandatory. But I think that is something that people should experiment with. And what most people will find if they're eating enough fat in their carnivore diet is they're going to start to skip a meal effortlessly. They're just not even going to think about it. They'll be like, I'm busy. I don't have time for breakfast. Or I'm busy. I don't have time for dinner. And they'll just start eating two meals a day. Many people, this goes to just one meal a day and they're not trying. Because if somebody has just come to this way of eating, they're like, shit, that must be so hard. And it's like, no, you don't understand. When you're eating enough nutrient dense, fatty meat, you don't get hungry all the time. You don't stay hungry all the time. You never get hangry. That ceases to exist in your world. And so it becomes effortless to eat two meals a day. 
And so if you eat two meals a day, you're fasting for 16 to 20 hours a day, every single day. And you don't even have to try. And I know for you newcomers who are still on a standard American high carb diet, you're like, that sounds like insanity to me. What do you mean you can eat twice a day in a six hour window and not be hungry the rest of the day? That's impossible. It is on your current diet, but it's not on a proper human diet. It's very easy to do. I eat one or two meals a day, and it depends on family, social, travel. But either one or two meals a day, that's my standard. And I like I haven't eaten today, and I don't know what time it is now, but I, I haven't even thought about eating. Right? It's what time is well, it? It's noon here. It's midday. noon where noon, I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't even, con I, that, just when I said that, I've thought about eating. I haven't thought about it all day. It doesn't occur to me to eat because I'm I'm going to go outside and play or I'm going to talk to my beautiful friend. I'm going to do things that I enjoy doing. Food is sustenance. Food is nutrition. Food is no longer pleasure. It's still very pleasurable when I break my fast, but it's not one of the major pleasures that I crave during my day. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I think for many people, especially if you're if you're severely overweight, you probably want to employ some some inter, at least daily intermittent fasting into your carnivore regimen. It's going to help you reach your goals quicker. If you have severe inflammation, you may want to do some 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 intermittent fasting. You may even want to do a two day or a three day, once every two weeks or once a month, to help speed up your goals. If you have lots of so so, let's take an example. Somebody's three hundred pounds overweight, random. It's almost impossible for that person to lose weight with calorie restriction and portion control and not have aprons of loose, saggy skin when they reach their ideal body weight, right? But what I've noticed in both the keto, the ketovore, and the carnivore community is when you're doing some degree of a daily intermittent fast and you're eating very nutrient-dense food, these people, their skin shrinks to a level that it seems almost miraculous. And it's not a miracle. It's not magic. It's physiology because they're getting the, the autophagy and they're getting the mitophagy from that daily intermittent fast. And so some people still, even with the intermittent fasting, they've got to go see the plastic surgeon and get the loose skin taken care of, right? But I know hundreds of people who intermittent fasting was part of the regimen and you can't tell they were ever severely obese. You can't tell they used to weigh 400 pounds because typically when people lose weight from that starting point, they're, they look amazing, but you can still tell they used to be very, very overweight, right? But there are some people in this carnivore community that you literally cannot tell that, that they used to weigh 300, 400 pounds because they got the benefit of that intermittent fast along the way. And so I, I don't think intermittent fasting is mandatory, but I think if you've got certain conditions or a certain body weight or certain body fat percentage, you probably ought to look into it and do your 30, 60, 90 day experiment with it. I think you'll be happy that you did. So what would you finally say to people watching this right now that are on the fence? I see so many people that, that, that they're saying, I'm on carnival for seven days, 30 days. Oh, I went off track. Yep. What are some words of encouragement from Dr. Ken Berry? Yeah, so meat is not in any way bad for you, not in any way dangerous. This has never been proven and never will be proven. Even the cheapest meat, if you're currently broke as a joke and all you can afford is hot dogs and bologna, you're still going to improve your health by eating that and avoiding the high carbohydrate inflammatory crap that the big food companies would love to sell you because in the end, they don't give a damn about your health. They just want your money. That's literally the truth of the matter. There is no pill that the big pharmaceutical houses make that is going to improve your health. Not a single one. They may help a symptom. They may slow down progression, but they do not improve your health whatsoever. That is a myth that they are happy for you to believe in because, again, they get to take your money if you believe that myth. The only way to improve your health, to improve your health, the only way to increase your longevity, your lifespan and your health span is to eat a proper human diet. That is, that needs to be the, the majority of where you, your thinking is, your research is, that needs to be where you spend your money, that needs to be where you spend your time, is getting your diet proper, 
proper for you? Are there people who should eat some a few carbs of, of, of clean one ingredient veg? Maybe. I don't think we know definitively. Should every human be a carnivore? I don't know if we if we know that for a fact. I think, and that's why on the proper human diet spectrum, it's anywhere from 100 total grams of carbs a day down to zero. And I think you need to experiment and play in that space and find where you feel best at the current stage of your life. And all, never forget, that may change as you get older. That may change as you get healthier. As you get more active, that may change. But we, and so don't listen to the dogmatic people. If you're in the, on the fence right now, you've done seven days of carnivore and you're like, well, I didn't die. And I, I think I feel better, but I don't know if it's safe to continue. Don't listen to the zealots in the carnivore community saying this is the only damn way to do carnivore to right. And if you don't do it like this, you're gonna you're a sinner and you're gonna die. Don't listen to those people. Okay, there are those people in every space that you inhabit, in every facet of human life. There are the Nazis and the zealots and the police. Don't listen to them. Do what seems right to you. Listen to people who you enjoy listening to. Don't join somebody's army. Become part of a tribe. Become part, part of a group that you enjoy hanging out with, who resonate with you, who are, there are people like you there. Everybody needs a tribe. And very often, Rena, our, our friends and family that we're born with, that's not really our tribe. Very often, they're never our tribe. I ha I yeah. haven't met one person where they say that. Oh yeah, my mom's sister, friend, or brother, or sister, or something is carnival. Yeah. Nobody is carnival, and yeah. you will not find somebody that's carnival. We have virtual friends. You have to yes. go to places where Dr. Berry's at, KetoCon, all these different places, and find yeah. your tribe. It's probably going to be virtual. Join Dr. Ken Berry's group or any other group. Yeah. That's where you're going to find the carnivals. Absolutely. And that support, that community, support, that, yes, that new family, that new tribe. Very often, you're going to be having carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms, sugar withdrawal symptoms, and you'll you'll lose, you'll give up, you'll fail. But if you've got that tribe of people saying, "Hey, I've been right where you're at. I know exactly how you feel. This is the trick or the hack that worked for me. Why don't you try that and let me be your support system here?" Walk, walk with me on this journey back to better health. We need that. We're tribal mammals. We need a tribe. And so if your current tribe is doing nothing but tearing you down and doing nothing but denigrating what you're trying to do to improve your health, find a new tribe. But in the process, don't become part of the Nazis, right? Don't become part of this militant police. You don't want to be that. And you also don't have to listen to them. Find a carnivore tribe that, that you resonate with and join them and walk with them as we all rediscover a proper human diet, as we're all walking each and every day back towards optimal human health. Anytime you're walking, you're going to stumble. Occasionally, you're going to fall. That's part of the journey. That doesn't mean give up or quit. That doesn't mean turn around and go back to being sick and unhealthy and overweight. Get up, dust yourself off, hold somebody's hand, Put your arm around somebody and let's continue this journey together because I promise you the benefits when you get there, they're going to so far outweigh the temporary drawbacks and setbacks. Ignore the setbacks. Ignore the stumbling stones. Turn them into stepping stones. That's that's how you, you step up and you look to the, to the future and say, ah, good health is there. Let's go get it together. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ken Berry. We're going to see you on Canal Diet for Men video, but thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for your time. And we'll see Absolutely. you very soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Rena. I hope you enjoy the interview with Dr. Ken Berry. You might like this interview next with Dr. Anthony Chafee discussing the worst carnival mistakes to avoid on your carnival diet. I'll see you next week.